be a great and awesome God. Make her creator of all things, sustainer of all things. Lord, we bless your holy name. We bless your name, Father. And we bless your name, Son. The Son. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. We bless your name. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we come praying right now that you would visit us on today, Lord. That you would shine on us, dear Master. That you would find our worship acceptable on today, Lord. We pray, dear Master. And for goodness and your mercy will overtake us on today. Lord, we pray for those who have requested prayer. We ask you to bless them, dear Master. We pray that you make each person at that point of need on today and provide for them the relief of their seeking and ask you for prayer. Lord, we pray for this church, the beginning church, Lord. We ask you to bless each and every member, dear Master, according to your riches and glory and your perfect will. Lord, we ask now that you would allow your presence, dear Master, to fill this place as we gather together to worship you on today. Bless each person, dear Master. Bless each home, bless each family. That's a special blessing for fathers on today, Lord, as they are being honored to this day, Lord. Bless them, Lord, fathers, and keep them Master, in your care. You've given them an awesome responsibility, dear Master. We pray that you would strengthen us as we go so we might do those things that you'll call us to do. Now, Lord, we ask that you would keep all the glory, dear Lord. That you would keep all the honor, that you would all, keep all the praise, dear Lord. And that you would just bless us according to your will. You love us and we ask in Jesus' name. And for his sake, amen. Amen. Oh.
the signs that make Jesus. My it's my choice. Is it your choice? Have you made that decision? Regardless of what the walls look like, regardless of what the hills are, regardless of the valleys you go down into, I've come to the conclusion today that Jesus the Christ is my choice. Hallelujah to the Lamb. His name is Jesus, the righteous Lamb of God. His name is Jesus. I said his name is Jesus. He's Mary's oldest child. He's the heart pulling in the back. He's the bright and morning star. His name is Jesus. Jesus is Christ. We showed up here today to worship him. To adore him. To thank him. For being our Savior, for being our healer, for being our deliverer, for walking with us. His name is Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for another prayer. Just to raise our hands and say thank you. Thank you, Lord, for another chance. Just to say thank you, Lord, for one more day. Thank you, Lord, for who you are, for what you've done, for the way you do things. You are the mighty God. You are God all by yourself. Hallelujah. You all not want to be in church. You couldn't feel something. I, I realize that church is not the feeling. I, I realize that that is that's, that sanctification is not the feeling. I, I realize that salvation is not the feeling. But the old folk in Mississippi would say it like this. I wouldn't have good religion if I couldn't feel it somehow. We thank God for another privilege, another chance to come by his house, the house of prayer, the house that God has set aside for worship. We have come to the church, the building, the location, the, the brick and the model. We've come to the church. Yes. And we've assembled as the church, yes. the bride of Christ, those of us who are saved, those of us who've been changed, those of us who have trusted Jesus as our Savior. We are the bride of Christ. We, we are the church. But every now and then, the atmosphere ought to get just right yes. where you can have some church. Yes. Hallelujah to the Lamb. It's all right to have a little church. It's all right. It's all right just to have church. Amen. Let me call your attention to 2 Corinthians. Chapter 6, verse number 18. If the former president would hear you say 2 Corinthians. <laughs> 2 Corinthians. Little boy said, I know that ain't right. That ain't what I mean. It ain't two Corinthians, it's, it's second Corinthians. Second Corinthians chapter six, verse number 18. When you found it, I'm reading from the New King James Version, you will find these words. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord. Almighty. I want to talk about loving God through fatherhood. All right, all right, all right. Loving God through fatherhood. Good, yeah. Still in the midst of the series called Loving God, we talked about loving God through faith, meaning that you have to make sure that you walk in faith if your Christian walk is not one of faith, it's not a Christian walk. All right. We talked about loving God through faith, meaning those things you can't see, you're going to trust God through it. Yes. We talked about loving God through truth in the fact that God's word is truth. And if we're going to walk in faith, if we're going to walk in truth, we got to make sure we have the un unadulterated word of God. Amen. His word is truth. And therefore, we must always focus on the fact that if it's in his word, we obey his word. Yes. 
not the things of this world. We don't even go to Google to check out what they say about the word because the word is true. That's why we have church. We have church because in the church we ought to be dispensing the truth. We come to hear the truth and then we show others the truth as we go forth. So we ought to be loving God through truth. And then we talked about loving God through Christ. It is that Christ Jesus, that son of God, the one who gave his life as a ransom for you and me, God says about him that he is my only beloved son. Yeah. Only beloved son. My only unique son. My only son that I have like him. He's my only son. And many will tell you we are all children of God. And they are correct because we are descendants of Adam and Eve. But the fact of the matter is we are only we are only saved and only become the children of God by Jesus Christ and what he has done on Calvary. Yes. I want to let you know, if it had not been for Jesus, you wouldn't have any bragging rights. Yes. And let me just stop and tell you, even right now, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, you still don't have any bragging rights. Yes. It says that we are saved by grace through faith, and that is not of ourselves. That's because it's a gift. It's a donation from God, and because God has donated it to us, we can't even brag about it. And it always points back to Jesus. Our salvation is in him, our sanctification is in him, and our glorification will be in him. It's only because of Jesus the Christ. So we ought to be loving God through Christ. Today, today, I want to talk about the fact that we ought to love God through fatherhood. Right. Let me just stop for a moment and say happy Father's Day to those who have become adopted fathers. Right. Those who have been solicited as fathers. Yeah. Those who, are, who have stepped in as father. And I want to let you know there is no such thing as a stepfather because you don't step over him, around him, or on him. You, you have a bonus daddy. You have a, a bonus father. Somebody that even though they wasn't a part of your biological makeup, he didn't present the 23 chromosomes from the man and mix those 23 chromosomes with the woman. Even though he's not your biological father, there are men all over this world that's stepping in and he's not a stepdad. He is a bonus person that, that God has often called in your life to make you who you are. Let me say happy Father's Day to those who are biological fathers, those who have who have done that chromosome thing, who have who have been there. And let me say to all those dads that they call deadbeat dad, you're not a deadbeat, just step up. Let me tell you, it takes a man to teach a boy how to be a man, and it takes a man to teach a girl what to expect from another man. They need you just like you need them. Happy Father's Day to every neighbor, every uncle, every cousin that has stepped up to, to give that role model that children so greatly need. And let me tell you, children are hurting today because there is no man in their lives that, is, that are making a difference. It's replete throughout the Bible. When you look at the things that are going on around young people, it's because of absenteeism. Yeah. It's because there's no male role model or no male dad that had told them, boy, you sit down. Right. Then, and it carried over into their adulthood. One fella, every time I say something that opposed to him, even in business, he want to tell me that I'm not going to be chastised. It's because you've never been chastised or never been disagreed with and no man has ever stuck stuck toe to toe with you that every time somebody say something, you want to say, you're not going to chastise me. I tell you, you got daddy issues. <laughs> you got father issues. You you can't take instructions even when instructions are right. And men, boys are hurting all over the world because they don't have somebody to to deal with them in the way that a man deals with them. Say that, Pastor. 
I just say to all these great mothers, we celebrated Mother's Day. People missed church. People flew all over the world. People drove for several miles to celebrate Mama. And uh, I know Father's Day. Uh, Father's Day, Brother Whitlock, will never add up to Mother's Day. I understand it. I accept it. I know, Brother Orr, that we will never get the credit that we do that mothers get. I understand it. But let me just say to your mama today, you can be a good mother, but you'll never be a good dad. It takes a, it takes a man, a born man, a man born right before the doctor hit it on his tutu and said, it's a boy. It takes a man to raise a man. So if you don't have a man in your life, young man, if you don't have a man in your life, you need to make sure that you come around godly men so they can teach you the way to go. And mama, get out of the way. I think I said it two more times. Mama, move over. Mama, get out of the way. You know, Papa, one day a woman stood up at Steve Harvey's show. And you know, they want Uncle Steve to tell him everything. He's been a three-time, uh, two-time loser, and, and could, could could become three. But but they want Uncle Steve's advice. And let me tell you, Uncle Steve got some advice for you because he learned through his mistakes. The tragedy is when people don't learn from their mistakes. Amen. They stood up at Uncle Steve uh, one day and said, "Look, Steve, let me ask you a question. How do I tell my husband that he's too hard on the boy? How do I tell my husband don't treat him like that?" Steve asked several questions. First of all, he said, have you ever been a man? Have you ever known what men go through? Are you a man right now? Well, move over, get out of the way, and leave the man alone. He need a little trouble in his life from a man every now and then. He needs a different disciplinary. He needs a strong arm. The late pastor E.K. E. E. Bailey says it like this. He says one day the doctor, daddy told the little boy, go outside and mow the yard. Mm -hmm. The mama said, he's not strong enough to mow the yard. My Lord. He said, boy, you get out there and you mow that yard. Yeah. Because, see, mamas think you have to be strong to mow the yard. But daddies know that mowing the yard makes you strong. I think I said it again. Mamas think that you have to be strong to mow the yard. But daddies know that you mow the yard in order to get strong. I think I said one more again because somebody over across the water didn't get it. I think I want to say it one more time. Mamas think you have to be strong to mow the yard. But daddies know you mow the yard in order to get strong. See, because boys are so much, uh, and I can say blanket statements here, boys are so much weaker than we were when we grew up. That's right, that's I mean, boys start crying at the drop of a hat because they've been sitting on mama, and mama been squeezing them all night and all day and telling them, baby, you don't have to go through this. I'm going to be here with you. Mama, move out the way and let daddy have this place. Now, I may need a security guard when this sermon is over. But the fact of the matter is, we got to get out the way and let daddy move and let God move. You see, because daddy, a real godly daddy, knows how much pressure to apply. He knows how much pressure to pull off. He knows how much pressure to they need because he examined himself when he was that age and he knew what he was going through. Yes. I mean, puberty is real. Yes. People talk about, I I'm, I'm living in this, this new age experience and I don't want my children to go through what I've gone through. Let me tell you, the reason why they're weak now, they can't even think, is because they need to go through some things sometimes in order to get somewhere. So it takes a man, a godly man, a real man, to teach a boy how to be a man. And it takes a godly man to show a girl what to expect in another man. It takes a man. It takes a daddy. It takes a man to teach girls what to expect in another man. At an early age, I used to take my daughter out to 
to Black IP, and then I was upgraded to Papa Do's, and, and we spending $25 on a meal that, that she couldn't even eat. And one woman asked me, why you take that little five-year-old out to a place where it's so expensive? I said, because when she grow up, I want her to know what expensive stuff look like. So when another man takes her somewhere where they're the expensive thing, she won't have to do anything in order to satisfy him because her daddy has already coasted her through. Yes, yes, yes. Fatherhood yes. is so valuable until we cannot continue to neglect it. Let me just pause here one more again. Even if the dad is not in the house, stop down talking to his daddy or her daddy and telling them that your daddy ain't this and your daddy won't do this because children grow up and they see it for themselves and let them determine who is what and what people will and will not do. Because when children grow up, they're going to look back at you and they're going to say, Daddy, Ain't that bad here after all? Yeah, I know he wasn't there. I know he didn't spend this kind of money. I know he didn't do this. And let me just share share with you. Every man that has a child ought to be, if he's not in the same house, on child support. I'm going to say that again. Every man who's not in the house, who has a child, ought to be on child support. Don't make any outside agreements other than the American General Association. The Attorney General, the American General, set the standard. And let me share something with you. They may not obey you, but they'll obey them folk. If I went in the pulpit, I'd tell you which folk. But when you put the, when, when you put them folk in their business, let me tell you, they bow down to them folk. Or they run the rest of their lives. Let me tell you, don't get so friendly with your ex or your one night stand or your boo until you say, oh baby, it's okay. Let me tell you, children are depending on what you do with their daddy and what you make their daddy do. I know I'm not talking to any of you in here, but the fact of the matter is, wherever it was made is what ought to be taken care of. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because the fact of the matter is, I should not be having to do what I do. I should not have to keep working for the children that you enjoy making. Look at how y'all looking at me in here. It's Father's Day. I can get by with it today. And when men become responsible, then respect is ushered back in. But woman, don't talk him down. Just be patient and watch what God does. Yeah. Even when there are men in the house, don't be telling children, yo, no down, no, no good daddy is nothing. Because let me tell you a secret. They're going to love him because he's daddy anyhow. They're going to treat him right anyhow. They're going to they gonna gravitate to him. He could not show up for six months. He could not show up for 12 months. But children still love him because they're their dad. So you're fighting a losing battle. And you get in their head. You, you put in their head that, that they are not there. And they don't do anything for you. And what you need to do is always boost your child's esteem. Because it, it affects the child negatively when you put stuff in their head. And when they grow up, they will say, oh, I've been lied to all my life. And then when they find out that some of it's true, they say, well, it wasn't all bad, mama. It wasn't all bad, grandmama, granddaddy. It wasn't all bad. At least he bought me a sandwich one time we went out to eat. It wasn't all bad. What I'm trying to tell you, if you love God, you will love fatherhood. Yeah. Women and men have to get to a point, along with children, they have to get to a point where they love the idea of fatherhood. The idea of a man showing them love. And when we look at this text today, we will find out that God is the perfect father. Oh, yes. 
The God that we serve, he sets a godly example. The Apostle Paul is writing to the church at Corinth. In his second letter that we know of, he's writing to the church at Corinth. And in chapter 6, he's talking about us getting our life straight. He says, he says to us that we need to make sure that we are aware of what marks come with ministry. In other words, in verses number 1 down to verse number 10, he says, be aware that there are certain marks that come with ministry. Be aware that there are certain things that come with ministry. Before you minister, you need to be born again. Right. As in the text. You know, I, I, I get bombarded sometimes by young men and, and they come to me and they say, I think I'm being, I'm being kept up all night by the Lord. I say, keep listening to it. I think, and I know where they're headed. I know, Brother Miles, what, what corner they're about to turn. And, and, you know, I have to get up and pray to God. You ought to be praying anyhow. And when I get up, I grab my Bible. You should have had it before you went to bed. And so, Sister Brown, they say, well, I believe I'm being called to preach. And I'm quick in a hurry to say, if you think you're being called to preach, go back and talk to God again. Because there are enough crazy preachers in the world right now. So you need to make sure that you're being called and not just think you're being called. Amen. And when I look at their lives, I say to them, no, you ain't called to preach. How you going to tell me what's going on between me and God? God is just calling you to get your life straight. God is just calling you to live for him. He's calling you to holiness. So these first 10 verses, the apostle Paul says, first of all, you need to be born again. You need to walk in salvation. And secondly, he says, watch your reputation. He says, not only do you need to be born again, not only do you need to walk in salvation, not only do you need that one-time experience of salvation, you need sanctification. So he says, live a holy life even when other folk ain't looking. Integrity is what a man or a woman will do when nobody else is watching. I mean, on Sunday morning, you all look like y'all just stepped out, the, out of heaven. I mean, you have the right smile, you have the right clothing, you know when to clap, you know when to laugh, you know when to shake your head, you know when to say hallelujah. You know what point in the song service that you need to stand, you look like you just stepped out of heaven. But on Monday through Saturday, let me follow you to your house and let me tell you, do not be ashamed of what the preacher see you doing because the preacher can't put you in heaven nor can he put you in hell. But what you do need to do, the Apostle Paul says, live a holy life day to day. These are the chapter 6 verse number 11. Verse number 11, Paul says, you old Corinthians. He said, all to you Corinthians. See what at that time the Corinthian church had fallen into false prophecy. They were following false teachers and false gods. So Paul writes to them and he tells them, just be holy. And then he does some things to tell us what a good godly man and a good godly father should be about. Oh, yeah. so statistics say that one out of four children grow up without a man in the household. That's for every four, one of those four grow up without a man in the household. And the impact of positive influence is lacking from a father figure or from a, a daddy himself. You know, we get cute in America. We say there's a difference between a father and a daddy. And somebody will tell you that, that a father is someone who makes a baby. But a daddy is someone who provides for a baby, who cares for a baby. You can give it any language you want to give it, any time you want to give it. Children need positive impact in their lives. They need a positive influence, somebody that they can see, somebody that they can touch, somebody that they can put their hands in their ear, their fingers up their nose, somebody they can play with, somebody they can be with. I was very fortunate. I was very fortunate all the way from 1963 to the year 2015, I was very fortunate to have a daddy was a, who was a creative genius. He was an innovator. 
He was somebody that would take nothing and make something. He was a dad. I mean, my, 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 my hallmark, my flagship of a relationship with him was every winter around November, we laying outside under the car, putting in a brand new transmission because my mama's Ford Maverick ran out during the winter every year. The transmission would stop clutching right, stop shifting right. Stop moving right. So my dad and I used to spend that time up under that 71 Ford Maverick. It was yellow. It was canary yellow. You can see it coming from way down the road. But when mama pulled in the driveway and it was jerking, I said, oh, it's my family time now under the car. And then after that Maverick came on the scene, she went and got another Maverick. The first one was canary yellow. The second was canary yellow with a white top. She went from a 71 to a 73 as if she had a brand new car. See, some of you don't know how, how working and, and moving. Our boys need to learn how to work on something other than games. I mean, some of them don't know what outside looks like until they go into school and come back home. Some of them doesn't know what pushing a merry-go-round will do for them. And for God's sake, they don't know what pushing a lawnmower and moving a weed eater will do for them. We have to get back to the basics, and I agree that we didn't do a very good job of passing values from one generation to the other. We have too many people. I don't want them to have to go through what I went through. And if they don't go through something, they're going to be sorry. Yeah, yeah. You're going to see them grow up sorry. Their friends going to see them grow up sorry. And they're going to be waiting on some woman to go to work and come home and ask them where the food is. I know that's bad English, but that's what they ask. Where the food is? What, what, what have you been doing all day? And don't let her come home too late. Matter of fact, we got men now, young men now, who are able-bodied young men, the ones with their britches around their knees, young men who, who show their underwear when they walk, young men who are criminals and running the street, they will drive a woman to work in her car, yes. <laughs> get her there on time, and then be late picking her up in her car, and she better not say anything to it's because, leave my baby alone, this is my baby. Mama never tried that because daddy was stirring around the house. Oftentimes tell the story that when we first got a, we first got a party line. I mean, you know what a party line is. We used to have a party line. And see, Miss Dale and Mr. Ulysses line would ring, zing, zing. And our line would ring, zing, zing. And so we would pick up the line, and sometime in the middle of the night, somebody would pick up the party line that don't supposed to be on the phone, and you would have to tell them, I'm on the line. And when the party line rang at our house, we could tell the ring, and we would expect Daddy to get it. Now here Daddy is sitting in his recliner. He worked all day, and he, he slaved for 16 hours. He got home, he got a meal. He sit down in his recliner to watch the world news tonight. That's why when I'm watching the world news tonight, I'm doing just like my daddy. I, I don't want anybody to interfere. I go in my room, I shut the door. I don't want to hear any piano. I don't want to hear any students running through the house. I'm shutting the door because David Miller is on at 5.30. And he's recapping the whole day. So daddy would be sitting in his recliner and we move from a party line to a private line. You know we had moved up to Beverly Hills then. We had a phone with a private line. We didn't have to worry about anybody else getting on the line. And when the phone would ring, daddy would just sit there and recline. And it would keep ringing. And we could never figure out why daddy wouldn't reach over next to his recliner and get the phone. But see, I learned the mistakes that my siblings made, so I never asked daddy why he didn't get the phone. One of my siblings wanted to know, daddy said, hey, this phone's ringing. One of my brothers had the nerve, the audacity of God, said, daddy, the phone is right there by you. Why you didn't get it? Oh, Lord, you thought heaven had messed up. He said, boy, 
That's why I have children. I don't have to answer the phone. We would have to run from the back room to the front of the house to answer a phone that's sitting right next six inches from my dad. And when I say run, we couldn't walk. We would have to get daddy called us. We want to make sure that whichever sibling he called knows daddy calling you. And that was a warning shot right there. Daddy calling you. When daddy called, it's worse than E.F. Hutton speaking. Phone rang, it was my time. He didn't have to call me. I got in a hurry, went in there and got the phone, answered the phone, and said, Daddy, it's for you. And if he didn't want to answer because World News Tonight was on, he's not available. I became his private administrative assistant. But it's because when there's a man around, there is structure. When a daddy is present, children see a side that they don't see when mama's around. All right. See, my daddy was a creative genius. He was excellent in innovation. And he would pass it on to us. And once he passed it on, guess what? It's like taking it to Jesus and leaving it there. He would pass it on. And see, because... We, regardless of what we were lacking, regardless of what we did not have, he would find a way to bless us in the midst of the struggle. He was the provider. He was a welder. He was a carpenter. He was a heavy equipment operator. He was a farmer. He was a plumber. He was a mechanic. He was the electrician. He, he was the protector. He was the advisor. He became the baker, the banker for us. He, he, was the, he was the counselor. He was the voice of reason. He was the one who loved us. And finally, he was the disciplinarian. In my generation, mama didn't have to whoop. Because I didn't want mama to whoop anyway because she got the end of the belts mixed up. She just, she, just, she just got emotional when she went. I didn't want a wrong mama. I remember 2 o'clock in the morning, I'm 14 years old, Earlene Johnson convinced me to go to Club Ebony right there where B.B. King was. Earlene Johnson, I haven't seen that girl since high school. She convinced me to go to Club Ebony. I'm 14. I go to Club Ebony and you know they had pay phones. It was a dime. I call myself going to be kind enough and call my mama and tell her, Mama, I'm going to the club tonight. She said, you ain't going nowhere. And I hung up the phone. <laughs> While she was saying, I knew what she was going to say. I just wanted to give her the privilege of knowing where I am. I got home. It was 2 a.m. in the morning, Sister Trejo. And I got to the light and I flipped the light on so I could see where to walk. And out of the darkness, <laughs> there came a voice. It wasn't a still, small voice. Daddy was there, but he stayed in the bedroom. He didn't bother me. See, a good daddy knows when to move. Out of the darkness came a voice, and it was a soprano voice. And that voice said, turn that light back on. And when I turned it on, the colliers in the weeks next door heard me. She had lost it. She got the end of the buckle on the wrong end. She got the end of the belt all mixed up. And let me tell you, from that day to this one, I never called mama and tried to tell her anything. I always called her and asked her something because that little 98-pound woman lost her mind in a matter of seconds. And see, young people, when we grew up, when mama and daddy were whipping you, they going to ask you some questions. And you better not answer. And then if you don't answer, then you got to got attitude. See, they say, they say uh, uh, oh, so you ain't going to cry, huh? Then you start crying. Shut that crying up before I give you something to cry about. And I'm wondering, what was the last 20 minutes about? But daddy was structured. He was real structured. He would come in and he would talk to you. Then after the conversation, about two minutes. So go in there and lay on your bed. He was a disciplinarian. 
and he would send you to your bed. You lay on your bed face down with your head hanging off the other side. And he just come in and lose his mind. I mean, children today, we didn't have time out. Anytime we heard the word time out, it was the end of the quarter in basketball. Or somebody had gotten hurt on the floor. Time out is when a coach called time out. We didn't have a time out. And I turned out all right. Daddy was the disciplinarian. He was the one that set the standard. As a matter of fact, he was so structured, when mama lost her mind, he would be the one to calm her down. We're very structured. I mean, everything was, was structured. Everything was in place. And, and he was a great disciplinarian. He even set me up in his car. Send my little brother with me. Tell me if he spent my tires. We get back down the street. My little brother says, hey, man, hit it one time. Hit it one time. <laughs> now, I don't know I'm set up. <laughs> so, so, man, hit it one time. Boy, I came around there from, from uh, Roosevelt Street onto Kenlock Road, and I was on two wheels. <laughs> we get home. I put the car in park. My back door opens up. My little brother runs in the house. Daddy, he smoked your tire. <laughs> It was structured. It's a disciplinarian. He, and, and, and I didn't have to say a word and he didn't have to say the word. When I walked in the door, he had his hands hanging out. And all I had to do was drop the keys in it. And that, those days of driving that car with the 455 engine in it were, were over. Those days were gone. I would never get them back again. You know how they say some people have died that never died before? My driving was dead on arrival. No more. So I had to flip my own tire. And then when I got a chance to flip my own tire, I realized that those flipping the tires, that burning of rubber cost money. Because of the structure. The Bible gives us many examples of what fatherhood is and how important it is. You see, Abraham was the father of faith. Elijah was the spiritual advisor to Elisha. Paul was the, the spiritual father to Timothy. Every man ought to have someone who can speak in their lives and someone who can tell them what to do. And regardless if you like it or not, you need to go through with it. Do you think I enjoy the little five foot five and a half man telling me what to do? I ain't talking about my dad. And he, he tells me what to do. The little five, I guess he's five five. He, 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 he hails at the Holy Tree in the church. You, you think I enjoy this little jet black man telling me what to do? But I have to suck it up. I have to eat my words and, and get it done. Everybody needs somebody who can speak into their lives and set them straight. Every woman, every girl needs somebody who's a friend to them that can tell them the right from the wrong. So daddy was that person who, who didn't, it didn't matter how mad you got. Didn't matter what you did after he told you. He just told you, and he didn't belabor on it. He didn't bring it up again. He just watched to see what you doing it. And if you didn't do it, oh, Lord, have mercy. So every person needs somebody to instruct them. Children are running wild. Children are losing their minds. Every day there's another shooting. Every day there's another stabbing. And you don't have to go to a third world country to see it. It's happening in the great United States of America. The land of plenty. The home of the brave. The home of the free. The place where we brag about how good we have it. Where we brag about our intelligence and our economy. Where we brag about this freedom that we have that no other country has. And now everybody is back in the gun. We missed it from the last generation. 
Everybody, I mean six-year-olds killing and shooting teachers. And then we find out after these young men have shot up schools, their parents have told them, you hide the gun here and don't let them see you bring it on campus. The day that Paul talks about is here, where people will be lover of themselves more than lover of God. We need a voice of reason in our midst that will stand and tell young people, don't go that way. There's a hole in the road. Don't go that way. But when we have parents that will attack the school teachers and attack the principal, attack the superintendent, but then they won't go to school and miss a day of work for anything. We need voices of reason. In Mark chapter 5, we find Jairus there. Jairus' daughter is weak and almost dead. And while he's talking to Jesus, the, the report comes that your daughter is dead. Leave the teacher alone. Jesus goes to Jairus' house. The girl is lying down. By now, she is dead. But the daddy knew if he could get Jesus to her. We need more daddies that are spiritually concerned about our children where they will get the children to Jesus and get Jesus to the children. In Mark chapter 9, we find a boy that's having seizures. He's falling in the fireplace. He's falling to the ground. He's demon possessed. The Bible says in King James that he has a dumb spirit because he was doing dumb things. He was casting himself in the fire. He was foaming at the mouth. This, this, this unclean spirit was tearing him apart. And this unclean spirit was causing him to grind his teeth together. Let me share with you. The man took his son to Jesus. He says to Jesus, look, I took him to your disciples and your disciples couldn't handle it. But Jesus said, this kind comes out only by praying fasting. We need some daddies that will pray and will fast over their children. God offers us a new and a perfect relationship. He is our father. All the things that your daddy has done. God has a better plan. All the things that your daddy has brought you through. All the things that I bragged about my daddy on. All the things that my children bragged about me on. God has a better plan. He has another relationship. He has a relationship that will never, ever, ever fade away. Psalm 24, 10 through 14 says that when my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will lift me up. Young people, I, I don't stand here be with I don't stand here not knowing that some fathers are not doing their thing. But the Bible says that when your daddy doesn't show up on time, when your daddy is not present with you, when your daddy is not there for you, then God himself will lift you up. We need young people who can stay close to God. In the text, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 11 through 8, and I'm going to run through these right quick and give you 10 of them, that we ought to focus on God, because God set forth the example of what fatherhood is really all about. We ought to love God to the point where we all want to be like God. We want to do what God does. Number one, God loves us so much that he speaks openly to us. God wants to talk to you. God wants you to talk to him. God wants a relationship with you through, through prayer. The problem is there are two things that's being neglected in the church. One is evangelism and the other is prayer. If we would pray, then God can move. We don't need, God doesn't need our prayers, but it strengthens the relationship and the fellowship when we talk to him. The late coach L.M. Brown used to say it like this. He, first of all, he would see you doing something wrong in the classroom. He would say, Nicodemus, sit down somewhere. And then he would say, the only reason that the world is still spinning on its axis is because there are some praying people left in the world. Let me tell you, church, we need to pray. We need to spend time in prayer. We need to have a prayer closet. We need to have a place, a shoebox or somewhere that we can sit down before God and read our Bible and talk to God about what we've read. I told you many times, we ought to pray the word. 
First of all, we ought to pray the word. We need to pray what God has written in his word and tell God what God has written. We ought to pray the word. And secondly, we ought to pray over the word. We ought to pray before we read, pray during our reading, and pray after we read that God will reveal to us what he is saying. So first of all, we need to know that God loves us so much that he wants us to talk openly to him. The Apostle Paul talks openly to them. Secondly, God restricts our affections. God restricts our affection. You can't just do anything you want to do. You can't just say anything you want to say. I cringe every time somebody in church, especially in church, says, says that you just got to accept me how I am. No, I don't. I can get away from you. And this is just who I am. That tells me, one, it tells me that you have not grown since last year. It tells me also that you're not concerned about growing. And it tells me also you're not concerned about God maturing you in the faith. So we have to make sure that we understand that God, God restricts our affections, our emotions. We got to stop being so emotional. Every time something happens, we're going to make a decision. Sometimes a no decision is a decision in itself. Take it slow. Slow roll it. Think it through. Don't do some folk have, especially young people, are out of good job because they spoke too soon. And they come to the conclusion, I'm not going to take that. Let me tell you, anywhere you go, you're going to have somebody that's going to tell you what to do. Anywhere you go, somebody's going to say to you, no, don't go this. And matter of fact, you can't have this day off for Mardi Gras. Somebody's going to tell you to show up when you don't want to show up. Some days they're going to be mandatory with you. And you are not going to want to do it. But you need to understand that God restricts our, our emotions. He restricts our affections. My third thing to you today, right here in the text, God instructs us to be equally yoked. Watch who you're with. Watch who you're hanging with. Watch who you spend time with. Back home, Big Mama would say it like this. If you, you travel with dogs, you're going to lay down and get fleas. <laughs> Let me interpret that for the folk under 45. What that means is, and the other thing they would say, birds of a feather flock together. Yeah. What that means is, if the police pull us up and y'all together, if he's doing something wrong and you're not doing anything wrong, the whole carload gone downtown to the big hotel on 1200. Yeah. <laughs> and they're going to keep you there until they ship you to another hotel. You have to make sure that you hang out with people who love the Lord and people who love you. Let me tell you, your friends won't let you drink and drive. Your friends won't let you smoke stuff that's harmful to you. Your friends won't let you hang out with the wrong friends. Your friends will support you in your endeavors. So don't be unequally yoked. Then he says, in number four, he says, God wants us, as it says in Proverbs 27 17, I'm sharpens iron. You need to be with somebody that's like you who love the Lord. Like you who heard some Sunday school. Like you who been in some Bible study. Like you who shows up at church even after the pandemic, even during the pandemic. You do know that family reunions are packed. You do know that sporting events are packed. You do know that, that baby showers are packed. But when we look around the room today, the same folk that were at the Astros the last game are going to go to Astros this coming game. And guess what? Craig Bidio don't know them. Yeah, yeah, know it. And don't care about them. But the God we serve, right he walks with us. Yeah, he, he talks with us and he tells us that we are his own. Yeah. So we need to be around people that sharpens us, mm -hmm. that challenges us. That makes us better. Number five, darkness and light can't coexist. Darkness and light cannot coexist. When we turn the lights on in this room, darkness, pew, have to go. They can't exist in the same place at the same time. And wherever there's darkness, in this sense, he's talking about the darkness of false prophets and the darkness of sin. He's saying to us today that we need to make sure we stick with God. Stay with him. God has the answer. God is the one who kept us. Big mama would say it like this. Big daddy would say it like this. The same bridge that brought me over is the same bridge going to take me home. Yes. 
we have to get to the understanding that we don't want to hang out in darkness. Let me just park right here and let you know, young people, because you have brown skin and you have dark skin, doesn't mean that you sin. Let me say that two more times. Just because you have brown skin and you have dark skin, doesn't mean that you're sin. Just because you have brown skin and dark skin doesn't mean that you're sin. You're just as good as anybody else in the room. I remember showing up at Mrs. Delta College, and when I walked in, I looked around, and I realized I was the only fly in a bowl of milk. I went home. You'll figure that Y'all tell your children what that means. You'll figure that out later. So I go home, and I tell Mama, Mama, I'm the only black person in the room. Her statement to me still lasts. She says that you are better at anything anybody else can do, you can do it better. And from that day to that one, um, at my 18 years old, from that day to this one, I still understand it doesn't matter what God gifts you with. It doesn't matter what God can do for you. Whatever I put my mind through, if God has gifted me in that area, then God is going to bless me. Yeah. Number six, God warns us against false gods. He points out Belial. He talks about Belial. Belial is the one who is vile, the one who is wicked, and the one who caused destruction. It is a God that stands against Christ. Anytime someone stands against Christ, the daddy ought to tell you, don't go that way. Don't hang out with them because they are the ones that are full of vile, thought, full of wickedness, and they cause destruction. Number seven, God reminds us that we are the temple of God. And he is within us and he dwells in us. He will be our God. We will be his people. God reminds us that our bodies are the temple of God. Paul says don't defile that. Don't mess it up. Hang in there. God has a way of blessing you. God, God has has come to reside in us. He lives in us. We are born again. We are saved. We've been made different. We've been made over. God has come to live in us. We can't put anything down on God. We can't. One woman told me when I was wild and foolish, and I, I, let me tell you, young people, I've been wild and foolish. I said, I've been wild and foolish. I've been both of them. All two of them. I've been wild and foolish. I was working graveyards 3 to 11. I was working five different shifts in one week. That's the most terrible schedule you can ever have. I walk in at 3 o'clock in the morning. My eyes are bloodshot red. Miss Jamie Simpson pulled me over and she said, boy, let me tell you something. You can't eat it all. You can't see it all. You can't drink it all. You can't get it all, so you might as well go home and get you some rest and go to sleep. Greatest advice I've ever had. Don't waste your time in foolishness. Foolishness will be there when other folk are still hanging out and you watching God move in your life. God reminds us that we have the temple and he resides in us. We are his people and he is our God. Number nine, God tells us to separate ourselves from the unclean ones. It's not about you being a bigot. It's not about you thinking you're more special than anybody else. But he wants you to be clean. So you have to separate self, yourself from the unclean. Oh, yes. And finally in verse number 18 he says. I will be a father to you. And you shall be my sons and my daughters. This is said by the Lord. Almighty. Number 10, the, the Lord Almighty, God Himself, are our fathers. We are His daughters and His sons. And what good thing would God do for us? Would God give us a snake when we want something to eat? No, no. God, if a father, an earthly father, would give his son and his daughter something good. How much more will our Heavenly Father continue to bless us? Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Our Heavenly Father has blessed us tremendously. He thought about us 
While we were yet in our sins, according to Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, while we were yet doing our own thing, while we were yet shaking the wrong way, while we were yet putting down the wrong stuff, God loves us. He loved us so much until he demonstrated his love toward us that he gave his son, Jesus Christ, to die for us because he's a good father. Every father needs to pattern himself after this God that we serve, he gave us his very best. We ought to give our children our very best. And let me just stop right here and let you know, money and child support is not your very best. Time is your very best. Instruction is your very best. Hanging out with them is your very best. You need to make sure that you pour into them. Because if you can't pour into them now, when they get pulled over by the police officer, there's no sense in spending all your money when you could have spent some time with them then. Jesus died for us. God gave his very best on a skull hill called Calvary. God gave Jesus for our love, for his love. God gave Jesus the Christ. He died between two thieves. He was buried in a barber tomb. He rose from the dead with all power in heaven and earth in his hand. If we're going to be the children of God, we must accept Jesus as our personal Savior. The door of the church is open. The invitation is extended. You need to get to know Jesus. The man asked a woman the other day, do I need Jesus to go to heaven? She said, brother, you need Jesus to go pump gas. You need Jesus to go to Walmart. And certainly you need Jesus to go to heaven. The door is open. The invitation is extended. Make up your mind right now that you're going to trust Jesus as your personal Savior. This is your moment. This is your opportunity to trust him. Will you trust him? Will you just believe the story that over 2,000 years ago on a stone hill called Calvary, Jesus gave his life as a ransom for you and a ransom for me. He bought us back. He paid the price. And he brought us back. He lifted us from sin. Will you trust him today? Will you come and give your life to Christ, believing that he is the Son of God, and out of obedience unto God, he gave his life as a ransom for you and me? The door is open. Will you come? And if you're here today and you never trust him, this is your moment. You need him to go to heaven. And if you're in this room or on the, online listening to us and you don't have a church home, I recommend the New Beginning Church where Jesus is the center of attention and the main attraction. Where Jesus is the captain of the ship. Where Jesus demonstrates himself as one who loves us and he keeps us. The door is open. Will you come? Come on, come on to Jesus. Come unto Jesus while you got time. While blood is running warm in your veins, make up your mind. He will make your life brand new. He will, he will. He will take care of you. Come on, come on. It means time's not guaranteed to any of us while you got time. Because I've learned just knowing Jesus, it will pay off. It will pay off. It will pay off. It sure has paid off in my life. Come on, come on, come on. Come on to Jesus. While you have time. While you have time. Yes, Lord. You may not even have a friend. But Jesus. But Jesus. 
he'll be there for you. And he'll go with you. He'll go with you to the end. Come on, come on, come on, come on to Jesus. Wow. Why do you have that? If you have not received Jesus as your personal Savior, this is your moment, this is your opportunity. Will you bow your head with me and, and, and ask Jesus to come into your life? Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Come into my life and make me a new person. In Jesus' name I pray. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Well, we thank God for who He is and what He's already done. We serve the awesome and the amazing, the anointed God. Thank God for this privilege of worshiping Him. Amen. Thank God for the privilege of worshiping, worshiping Him. It is now offering time. It's time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrifice. Gift. If you need an envelope, please raise your hand and you will be served. If you need an envelope, please raise your hand and you will be served. Raise your hand way up in the air and you will be served. Hallelujah to the Lord. Father God, we thank you now for this privilege of giving unto you. We thank you for money. We thank you for income. We thank you for increase. We thank you, Father God, for blessing us. In our stewardship, Father God, bless us to be steward, righteous stewards unto you. Bless every giver and bless every gift. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and thank God. Missouri City, Texas, 
77459. That is PO Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Father God, we thank you for these gifts. In Jesus' name. to celebrate with you and see what you're going to feed us. Uh, we are so glad that you were born. Amen. Amen. Well, that's our guest on the second row to stand up and say hello to us. Amen. Just stand up. It's always the guest that's looking around that's, that are talking about. It. Amen. Say hello to us. Tell us who you are. Who invited you? Who invited me was my son, uh, Kevin Katrina Whitlock. Uh, so uh, we're thankful to be here to enjoy this day with them. Yes, amen. Uh, son said this is Father's Day, so why don't you come over and share with you? Thank you all so much for coming. We'll be praying for you all, and you all sure will pray for us. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you for living with us. We're so glad to have you. And it is Father's Day, and I get to take Father's Day pictures with all my children today. Amen. With all of my children, and you all get to take Father's Day pictures immediately after. Amen. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you for being a part of our service. For those who, um, for those who, um, who would like to give to Turning Hearts and their music program, please feel free to do so. Um, you can write the check or cash app or email or Zelle to Turning Hearts, Turning Hearts Ministries. 
Uh, we want to empower that ministry straight from home base. Amen. Yeah. We, don't, we don't want others to influence our ministry financially more than we do. So we want to empower that ministry. There are great testimonies for at least now five generations. Amen. Amen. There are five generations of, of musicians who have come through here. But we have one testimony who has had children come through here. And many of you in this room have had cousins and uncles and nieces who have come. So we want, to know, want you to know that we are receiving financial gifts to empower Turning Hearts Ministries. Our, our summer enrichment camp is coming up uh, next month, so we want to be strong, and we want to make sure that our ministry is strong. We need things like food, we need things like money, and we need things like your participation. Amen? Thank you. Amen. Thank you so much for being a part of it. Amen. Thank you for contributing. On Wednesday night, we will be baptizing. Uh, we are preparing to baptize on Wednesday night a young man that's going off to the military. He has chosen the New Beginning Church to be the church where he's he's going to be baptized. So in the middle of our service, amen, that's a good place to clap right there. In the middle of our service on Wednesday night, we will take him to the water after we led him to Christ and, and he has gotten it right with God. Amen. And so he wants to be baptized at the New Beginning Church. So we will be doing that on Wednesday night. So all of you who are engaged in baptism, please, ma'am, please, sir. Be prepared for baptism. Amen. Hallelujah. We serve the awesome and the amazing God. He is blessing us. Everybody who's doing your Bible reading, continue to do your Bible listening, rather. Your Bible listening, continue to do your Bible listening. And the text that you get from me on, on Monday morning, do your Bible reading. And uh, those Bible reading prepare you for, for uh, Sunday morning, Sunday school. And I'm on a campaign to increase the numbers in our Sunday school, increase the numbers in our Bible study, increase the numbers in our Sunday worship service. Will you join me to increase those numbers to make sure you invite people? The Bonner Report, which does all these surveys, the Bonner Report says 47% of the people that come to church, they come to church because a friend invited them. It's not, I, I'm, I'm happy to tell you, it's not because of the preacher's great preaching that they come to church, amen? They come because their friends invite them to come. And only 7% of the people who come to church that show up because the preacher has a great message. So thank y'all for being a part of 7%, amen? Thank you so much for being that, that 7%. But we need to reach out to that 47% and get people in church because people need church, they need Jesus. And I, they're gonna tell you that I worship online, but they're also gonna, gonna see you at the family reunion in person. That's right. Amen. So yeah. we want we want to pack our buildings and nightclubs are full again and eateries are full and parties are going on. We wanna pack our building with souls, amen? amen? Only what we do for Christ will last. All the rest of that stuff that's fading away is like shafts driven by the wind. So let's, uh, let's pack out our church building and make sure that people get on in, get in, get in impacted by the word of God. Amen. Amen. Also, those of you who were here for the demonstration on last Sunday of stewardship of giving back to the Lord and how the Lord continue, continue to give to you. In the back, we still have some of those sheets. If you're still questioning what your tithes and offerings should look like. We've broken it down from the last penny all the way up to the upper dollar. Amen. And if your number is not on that sheet, hallelujah. Hallelujah. You need to give even more. Amen. I think the sheet goes up to $150,000 a year or a week or whatever. So if your number is not on that sheet, raise your hand right now so I can tell you what you ought to be giving. Amen. So we want to give back to the Lord through stewardship and make sure that we're doing our part to bless the Lord. Now, let me just share with you. God doesn't need your money, and I explained that to you last week. He just wants the relationship and your fellowship strengthened by you giving unto him, not grudgingly nor out of necessity, but God loves a cheerful giver. Amen. Happy Father's Day to all the men. I want to ask Sister Cora Woods and, and Sister Davis to come as we continue to celebrate men. I want Sister Davis to go first and then uh, Sister Woods. Amen. 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 Come on up, children, from the Sunday school class.
this morning, we made some crafts for our, for their fathers. So here are the little things that they read. I'm going to ask them to read what they said to their father. And we're going to ask, I don't know if their fathers are here. No? Oh, okay. We're going to ask daddies to come on up and receive once this read. Okay, we're going to start with Kevin. Happy Father's Day. Kevin <laughs> doesn't have that on his card. He has Feliz Dia de los Padres. <laughs> Feliz Dia de los Padres. All right. Happy Father's Day and thank you. Say it in Spanish. Feliz Día de los Padres y gracias. Happy Father's Day. Thank you for loving us. Uh, Feliz Día de Padres. Gracias por amarnos. Happy Father's Day. I thank you for being in my life. because he did teach me how a man's supposed to treat me. And I'm just going to tell you this. The man that came to visit me one day, my dad had him on his knees asking him questions about his parents. And he left. He never came back. <laughs> but from the New Beginning Church, uh, we always try to give uh, fathers and mothers a little token of the, our appreciation. So I have a gift for... Uh, all the fathers here. And I just want to say happy Father's Day. If the fathers will stand, I will come on and give them to you. That includes you too, Pastor David. Where is all the fathers to stand? Amen. Bed to bed in the house. Well, Fasa. Fasa. Bed in the house. Amen. Dad's in the house. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Um, I want to share what the Mellow Kids did for me. Uh, they made this card set for uh, Mr. Galvan, and then. Uh, the inside is says, uh, uh, Happy Father's Day, Mr. Galvan. So thank you. Thank you, Melody. Thank you. Well, again, Dan doesn't have to cry now. He's got his father's name. His is in Mexico. And so he's, uh, he's receiving, the, receiving the gifts from the other children. So he doesn't have to cry now. He, it's going to be all right. Amen. It's going to be all right. Amen. Amen. Did you, did Cora, brother, brother Mayo, get one? Oh, he was standing for a second one. You got brother Aspen? I got Pastor Davis. Yes, ma'am. 
Amen. Now, um, every year we know who the crown champion of fatherhood is, right? You all know? Who is it? Brother Elsa, how many children, grandchildren, and great grand you have? Get the microphone. About 49. Some on the way. 49 and counting. Good God Almighty. Amen. I told Deacon Alpha, if he would just get all of his children and grandchildren to come in church, our attendance would increase by 200%. <laughs> literally, literally. Children and grandchildren and great grandchildren. And then those on the way, good God Almighty. We have shown up to have a church here. <laughs> Amen. We would really have a church. He got some folk, boy. And one thing about it, you throw a rock at that house, folk will never stop coming out. <laughs> people never stop coming out. Look, won't we stand to be dismissed? Let the church say. Father God, for every child. We thank you for family. We thank you for blessing us and keeping us. We thank you, Lord, that you're the God who disciplines us. You're the God who keeps us focused, and you're the God who continues to keep loving us. Now, Lord, we ask you to bless us as we go, that we would take your love to those that we meet. Now, unto him who is able to keep us from falling, unto him the only wise and only true God, unto him be power, glory, and dominion. Until we meet again, let us sing together. Amen. Our mission and vision statement. We are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus said, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. John 12 and 32. You are a business.